again, everybody. Uh, this is Todd Lohr with the Risk Management Center coming to you in a follow up presentation where we're going to talk about Chapter 2D of best practices. This is relating primarily to spillway erosion. Historically, spillways have taken a, a little bit of a back seat to um, like the primary dam features because um, they, they, they haven't tended to have the same magnitude of consequences. And often, often the spillway failure incidences are fairly low and um, the consequences are fairly low compared to, you know, breach of the entire embankment or the or loss of the whole reservoir. And a lot of times that's because spillways will develop Spillway failure modes will develop much slower. So there's an increased warning time and more, more opportunity to get people out of harm's way. The other reason is because um, a failure of the spillway often doesn't release the entire entirety of the reservoir. It's, it's usually the upper portion to some degree. So those two things have, have, have made it so we, we, we didn't really pay attention during risk assessments or even dam safety studies to evaluate uh, spillways as as much as we are right now. A lot of that is because of the Oroville failure in 2017. But to be honest, there's there's so many other reasons to be bringing and evaluating spillways during our risk assessments. One is uh, public perception. Um, to me, that's fairly important one. Uh, spillway failure is high profile and it often is attributed to the competency of the agency or the owner of that facility. And um, those are those are not things to be taken lightly. Um, there's also lots of as high associated repair costs. There's often operational, long-term operational and uh, O&M type costs with continued deterioration of, of spillway features. And um, the other thing is we can have pool restrictions implemented on a project that can severely impact hydropower and water supply. Um, the other thing is failures often, what we're seeing is that fail, most of these failures that have happened on, on, on spillways recently and in the past, they've occurred at lower flows than were anticipated and at, at lower flows than had ever operated through the spillway. So it's not necessarily um, just ma large magnitude flows. It's, it's, there's something else going on. There's some temporal or long-term deterioration that might be impacting spillway performance. And the last bullet, Sarah, here is that spillways are expected to operate and function as designed during extreme hydraulic events. So maybe, Maybe what we need to be thinking about is, will this spillway be operational and functioning throughout the throughout the course of the spill event that we are um, that we are managing, that we are controlling? Okay, so the objectives of this presentation are to characterize the me mechanisms that affect spillway erosion. We'll construct and walk through a couple of vent trees that represent spillway erosion and and failure mode sequencing. We'll present the considerations and uncertainties that make this potential failure mode either more or less likely. So we'll go through all those parameters that, that we need to understand so that we can characterize our uncertainty better while we're in the risk assessment. And we need to understand the differences and limitations of the different models that are used to quantify soil and rock. Uh, some of that was discussed previous in the previous um, um, presentation, so I'm not going to go on that too much. but. Uh, I don't want to reiterate things that were just said. Okay, so uh, key concepts, um, the hydraulics and the geology of the spillway flows and the foundation and the, poti the potential to initiate and sustain um, erosion and the duration of flow frequencies are significant in, in evaluating spillway uh, failure modes. The general difference between erosion of a uniform material and that of a highly varied and spatially complex geology. So we need to understand the spatial uh, resistance or poor performing rock or soil conditions and, and make sure that we have a good handle on that relative to the spillway alignment. Um, we need to estimate the magnitude of 
spillway scour head cut and migration that's required and that is experienced based on the hydraulics geology hydrology and structural conditions um, failure mechanisms can be linked to the likelihood of other failure modes so the the spillway failure might also um, impact tunnels stilling basins control structures um, and other features and operations as well the outline of the presentation will do a number of case histories we'll go through a general event tree a failure sequence that is that's related linked to both lined and unlined type spillways we'll go over the key factors that affect vulnerability of spillways and spillway failures and then key takeaway points that are going to be related back to uh, performing risk assessment case history so the first one is rica bio dam this is a dam that's in italy spain sorry oh my gosh i just got it confused with another one so no this one is in spain it was constructed or completed in 1933 320 foot high arch dam with a 1300 foot long unlined spillway channel on the off the left abutment the spillway channel is constructed on uh, fractured granite and there's a fold structure a fold or a fault structure located across the chute that, that becomes kind of important so we'll look at the, the spillway migration in these photos um, the design discharge was 4,000 me cubic meters per second and over its time frame between 30, 1934 and 1939 um, it had five major scour events that occurred five major flow events um, the last one's not shown because it, it was fairly minor but so what we see here is this significant down cutting significant headward migration of this um, of this rock mass during these relatively small flows you can see the, the highest magnitude flow is this 12 1280 meters per second that's that's quite some magnitude different than what the design estimate was for so right now we're looking at a profile of the spillway the upper figure we'll look at first here's the control structure here's the spillway um, spillway chute and this was sort of the drop point back into the river during the first flow so what we have mapped out here are the erosion zones that occurred during each of these events so if you remember this first one was just at 100 cubic meters per second and then the second third and fourth are, are configured like that but i think what we see is that significant erosion and head cutting happened during one two and three four did some downward erosion and, and a little bit of head cutting but it, it sort of got stopped in five which was the highest flow that had been seen didn't really remove that much more material so when we look down at the lower figure what we're seeing is the rock structure generalized pitch, picture of the rock structure we have one we have fracture sets that are dipping relatively steeply and then we have these other sets of discontinuities that may be related to this fold structure in the middle fold or fault structure and so what this does is it breaks the spillway from upstream to downstream into two different domains structural domains is what what they're referenced as before because the joint orientations and joint structure maybe the spacing and tightness and orientation are even different in some of these um, domains but in zone one downstream major joint structure dipped downstream with the flow and that means it had a lower resistance because of the orientation of those joint or joint structures upstream in the zone one we had upstream dipping uh, joint structures that were a little bit more favorable so that's the interpretation of why so much erosion happened in the first three spill events and less erosion happened in the fourth and fifth spill events that were much higher so there's the removed material this is a picture of rica bio dam today um, the the solution was a lot of concrete 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 and the question we have to ask when we look at these case histories is what's the geological condition how is this rock mass behaving under these water flows and do we have these conditions do these conditions exist at every rock spillway site no of course not we don't see this type of type of issue so so we have to understand those conditions and understand them relative to whatever project we're working on moving forward 
Sailorville Dam is in Iowa. That's an Army Corps dam. has an uncontrolled OG weir, an unlined spillway chute off the right abutment. Spillways can comprise of gently dipping shales, calcareous siltstones, and thin limestones and coal beds. Uh, it operated between June 18th and July 3rd, so 14 days in 1984, and the flow that was coming down the spillway channel was estimated to be only 9% of what the design flow was. But the result was severe damage to the unlined section of the spillway, and we can see that in these photos down here. We had significant erosion of the shale and, and, and siltstone limestone beds downstream of the dam. Some photos of the site after the erosion. There was a field investigation and a rock, uh, rock scour assessment to evaluate the need to uh, modify the spillway structure and improve the, improve the safety and performance of it. So we see here are a lot of bedded, tightly bedded laminated shales with these interbedded more um, apparently strong or, or stiff siltstones and sandstones and limestone layers. So the geologic profile from, from upstream to downstream shows that we had multiple head cut, um, head cutting um, ledges that were all in sequence, uh, you know, they were all migrating upstream and eroding, you know, at simultaneously. But what we have is a classic ledge, plunge, plunging jet, back roller and head cutting situation. We saw this image in a previous slide, but that's exactly what we had at this site where the back rollers plucked the shale, removed the shale, undermined the siltstone, which collapsed down into the, the erosion hole. And those siltstone blocks were not large enough to withstand the back rollers and they were washed away. So this process is likely to continue, especially if we get flows that are well above 9% of design, right? So, so this was a Consider this was considered a, a critical situation, and the design involved building additional cutoff walls, um, protection of the slopes, and modification of the spillway channel downstream. So here we're going to walk through a general event tree, uh, a failure mode event tree with all the sequences, the nodes broken out uh, separately, and this this is generalized, but it can be applied to both unlined and lined type spillways. So the first thing, of course, we have, we have a weir upstream, we have fractured rock or, or weak soil or something downstream, and there's probably a little nick point uh, at some point. So we have loading, right? The, the flood comes, the spillway flows at some volume, depth, velocity, turbulence, and duration downstream at our nick point or at a place of higher erosive capacity of the water. Maybe the erosion resistance of the material is, is less in this area because of fracturing, because of weathering, because of um, soil, different soil parameters. Um, maybe we get flow concentrations, a channel drop, there's a nick point, shear zones, fault zones, weaker soil, rock, that sort of thing. But that head cutting migrates upstream toward the weir and it continues, it deepens. Blocks fall in, blocks get removed, blocks get uh, transported downstream, and uh, back roller jets continue to undermine and potentially cause damage to our weir. Now, a couple things can happen. If the scour hole enlarges enough, it either exposes adversely oriented discontinuities or daylight bedding planes in the foundation that cause that weir to slide, or perhaps um, it undermines it to a point where it overturns and topples and fails into the, the plunge pool. So the question, you know, we always have to be thinking about and always asking when we're when we're in these risk assessments, is it either for the entire nodal sequence, for the entire failure mode sequence, or, or even on a per node basis, what is the likelihood based on verbal descriptors, what is the likelihood that we would attribute to each of those phases or to the whole process, you know, as a whole? So we we do that with using judgment, using discussion, using our less likely likely tables and, um, and the data that we have in our knowledge of the site and the three dimensional aspects that are at play here. This is a failure mode sequence for a line spillway. It's 
basically similar, but instead of just rock fracture or uh, weak rock, weak soil, we have a shoot slabs that are covering that foundation. So what we have is somehow we remove the slabs, hydrojack or, or fail them by undermining. Once it exposes the foundation, the foundation is um, eroded by the plunging forces and the back rollers that occur and headward migration occurs that undermines the spillway slab that topples down into the hole and the process repeats itself over and over. So does the material or damaged slab provide any armoring? You might have to think about that. If it's heavily reinforced with big thick slabs, it might it might actually withstand some of the some of the erosive force that's associated with this flow. That's what this upper photo is showing us. This is Guajataka Dam. The head cut and the failure removed a bunch of the slabs, but once it got to the more competent, competent slabs that hadn't been so deteriorated, they they somewhat held up as the flows diminished, of course, and and they resisted a lot additional um, erosion from the de depleted uh, pool elevation. This is a typical photos cross section um, architecturally architectural drawing and design drawing for what is generally uh, a well built slab configuration. So if if we have a, a condition where the slab is well designed, it's probably quite thick. You know, it's it's perhaps six, 18 inches in some cases at, at I think this garrison, it's almost three feet thick. It's anchored into competent foundation rock. It has drain holes to drain the rock. It has drain pipe system that takes flows that get in and through the cracks or through the soil and flow around and, and bypass the drains. Um, so there's a number of defensive measures that are designed or built into the, the slab the slab features. Another one might be turndowns or cutoffs, uh, a number of them perhaps, down at the toe, maybe up by the control structure. Those extend down into competent rock and they force erosion down deeper and then back and up through potentially more resistant material. So we have to understand slab design, anchor design, what's missing. There's a lot of times where none of these components exist in a, in a shoot slab and they may not be reinforced. It's just concrete sitting on sitting on soil, perhaps. Um, so, so the reason that's all important is because concrete deteriorates. It is exposed to freeze thaw. It, it cracks when it's cooling. It has, um, it has a potential to heave or be displaced or deform because of different physical conditions. Maybe the foundation is weaker or has allowed settlement or, or the slabs are heaving or being pushed up or something like that's happening. And what we get are cracking or we get this offset. So the offset is, is really, really critical because the offset causes what's called stagnation pressure to develop under the foundation. These pressures can be extremely high, maybe higher than just the, just the weight of water sitting above them because they're surging and they're pulsing and they're, there's, there's aeration and it's collapsing and a lot of hydraulic pressures get surged down into and under these slabs. And these pressures can be significant. They can pop these slabs off even if they're reinforced, even if they're anchored. These, these pressures also inject lots of water and they can cause erosion, that can overwhelm the drain systems. So the, the performance of the concrete slab is, is really critical in assessing slab and, and blind concrete line spillway performance. This is a generalized line spillway failure sequence. Of course, the first thing is a spillway flow at some volume, depth, velocity, turbulence, duration. Some sort of flaw exists either in the concrete or we are, we're able to get water, unacceptable amounts of water injected into the foundation. So those, those can happen from offset slabs, cracks at construction joints, cooling joints. And the foundation water can come from seepage, groundwater seepage, reservoir bypass into the, into the foundation, or maybe um, there's water that can seep into cracks from, from the spillway operating. Or, or the spillway can overtop training walls and go around the outside. Um, so then we have initiation, the slabs offset. The offset slabs cause stagnation pressures that allow slab sla sections to be hydrojacked and removed. That exposes the foundation. 
Alternatively, we get our underdrain system is overwhelmed by water being injected through cracks or coming around or bypassing. This increases uplift and it also can cause deterioration and erosion of the foundation over time. And this can cause the slabs to shift, crack, buckle, rotate, and induce differential settlement that then propagates the stagnation pressure during a, um, during a flow event. Again, slabs removed and foundation exposed. Once the foundation's exposed, we can concentrate turbulent flow and remove further slabs by eroding the foundation and undermining and head cutting up, up, up flow. So again, continuation, the erosion hole enlarges in the direction of the flow and the stream power increases. Back rollers and falling jets remove foundation material if it's, if it's not resistant enough. And this results in additional slabs falling, just like we had looked at previously in the example. Intervention is unsuccessful to stop this erosion. You know, you have to think about that. Maybe it's not. A lot of effort has been made to try to thwart um, spillway erosion in the past. It's hard to tell if it's been successful or not, and, um, from my experience. Uh, the control structure is destabilized. So uh, the scour hole enlarges wide and deep enough to undermine probably multiple monoliths. The monoliths fail either by sliding into the scour hole, maybe on passive wedge discontinuity features, um, removal of the wedge and sliding on its foundation, or, or overturning into the enlarged hole. Either way, this results in uncontrolled release of the reservoir and resulting in downstream consequences. So that those sequences are for more or less the the nodes or the, the steps that occur during a spillway failure mode risk assessment. So there's a lot of considerations when we go into a, uh, a failure analysis, um, a risk analysis when we're dealing with the line spillway. So I'm gonna list a bunch of those out here. We have foundation con considerations, possible deterioration, geology, degradation over time, possibly erosion, possibly, um, possibly without indicators. Maybe there's creep, soil creep, or downward hill creep, or, or stress relief type features that are opening up in the foundation So, because it's on a steep slope. So a lot of times these creeping underlying deterioration issues might not have any indicators. Um, we need to understand how the how the drain system works, the under drain system. Is it operating effectively? Uh, what's the layout? What's the, was it designed properly? Is it plugged? Is it deteriorated? Is it crushed by the overlying slabs or, or other features? Um, cracks and defects within the slab itself. These can come from temporal fatigue, vibration, deformation, cooling cracks, um, freeze thaw. Uh, maybe it's just along the contacts, the, the cold joints. So if these can allow excess water into the spillway foundation, we need to be really, really concerned. We need to be concerned that, that, that those infiltration, oh, infiltrating water is not causing additional foundation deterioration. So a lot of times um, we can do crack, detailed crack mapping and synthesize that with our understanding of the foundation geologic conditions and pull those two together and other information, maybe where the drains are and that sort of thing and synthesize that information so we understand where and how you know the the slab is performing temporal deterioration of the whole system due to physical and chemical weathering processes so freeze thaw wetting drying water infiltration this is similar all similar processes to rock weathering but it's all occurring to that slab on that hillside is there an end sill or a cutoff structure relative to the material or meaning is it embedded into competent material has there been an uplift evaluation? Have we analyzed what the possible uplift pressures may be? Maybe there are also contrib contributions from springs, groundwater, even local piezometers can connect different aquifers or different water bearing zones and, and increase pressures. What's the anchor design like? Is it uh, adequately designed? Is the capacity depth, was the design bond and uh, uh, material target were those designed appropriately or is there areas where possibly it's deteriorated maybe the capacity or spacing was 
insufficient, maybe there's deterioration or, or corrosion of the of the anchors. So is there a development of a plunge pool in the failure mode? So as we remove slabs and we build a plunge pool, the more that a plunge pool fills with water, the less energy is delivered down to the base of the plunge pool. So, so often a plunge pool has a limit, presents a limit for some amount of flow on how deep and how much stream power can be um, generated within that plunge pool. Is there armoring or scouring of the pool? Do these concrete slabs fall in there and protect it from headward migration? And is there spillway training? Is there a spillway training wall that can be overtopped along the margin? All right, this is uh, Oroville Spillway, 19, uh, 2017. It failed at generally lower flows than it had seen before and lower flows than it was designed. It was a chute failure and it was related to erosion and cracking of the slab. The key vulnerabilities were related to a thin chute slab, the underdrain, the underdrain pipes extended up into the slab and cooling joints formed parallel to all of those pipes. Um, flow, water flow was went into and under the slab at a magnitude that overwhelmed the under drains. The anchors were adversely designed in this area where the where there was a shear and a fault zone that relates that juxtaposed, you know, weak, weathered, highly fractured and sheared material. So the anchors all went to the same depth, regardless of um, the material they were in. And that was a problem too, because they had no capacity to resist the uplift. So there's adverse foundation conditions. So key aspects affecting spillway failure vulnerability. This slide, I'm not gonna spend time on. This basically summarizes almost everything that was presented in the previous presentation. We have the soil erodibility assessment and resistance evaluation that we need to perform for rock same thing rock erodibility index and um, comparing that to the stream power so we need to assume all these parameters and understand them as we move into this type of risk assessment so also what are the site conditions what are the spatial extent of the geologic and geotechnically adverse features and conditions does a weak rock that we see on the surface at this particular geologic condition does that extend infinitely to depth or does it extend does it extend along a shear that's in line with the spillway structure or will it cross it that was similar to what happened at orville the 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 water exploited that weak shear zone but that shear zone didn't go straight up to the control structure it crossed the the, the, the slabs across the chute at an angle fortunately so it didn't migrate as easily upstream. Um, all this information, all those nodes that we walk, talked about, all the, the information that we talked about what makes this failure mode migrate to breach of the structure, we have to put that into the context of the hydrograph at the site and specifically the spillway outflow hydrograph, if that's what we're talking about. So, so where are we at each node on this hydrograph. A lot of that is judgment. It's really difficult to assess um, head cut migration rates. It really comes down to experience and judgment and, and build, building the case for your assessment. Um, there's a lot we can do with laboratory testing and physical and hydraulic modeling. Um, this down here is Bluestone Dam. They built a physical model with a removable stream bed and they they were able to make some judgments about erodibility of, of the rock in their stilling basin based on some of the physics and observations they made during that test. This is a computational fluid dynamic model. We saw that also in the previous presentation. We can get stream powers, velocities, and um, I understand where where the, the high energy water, high scourability water is, might be located relative to our geology and our site conditions. Down here, this is a large scale physical model of the Thule River spillway. And interesting, what was interesting here is that after it comes over the weir structure, which is right where the red pointer is, a lot of the flows were diverted over into the right abutment. So that drove a lot of our assessment of um, the, the risk when we were in the risk informed design uh, framework. So, so we were able to address this with some engineering um, engineering measures. So the, the 
last couple of concepts here, we have to understand the temporal aspects of spillway risk. Um, risk can migrate over time. So as because we have we have this comment, <laughs> we have past performance is no guarantee of future performance. So what that means is that we can have these temporal effects that cause deterioration in the spillway, either in the slab, in the foundation, in the groundwater conditions, in weathering, in uh, freeze thaw processes, which would be included in weathering, I understand. <laughs> we also have changes in our hydraulic loading potentially. We have new modeling methodologies that might change our frequency and our, our flow amounts. We have climatic changes that we're dealing with and trying to predict, and there might be operational change at the overall facility. Then there's also potential changes in the downstream consequences, more people moving into, into flood prone areas. So the, the rate that risk changes or is anticipated to change can be a good indicator for future decision making. So, so the, the benefit of doing a risk assessment on our spillways, evaluating them, managing them, operating them, and, and inspecting them on a regular basis is it informs these risk management activities, which pretty much goes without saying for almost all dam safety issues at critical infrastructure. We need to have, um, we need to have a plan for observations and inspections, continued technical dam safety assessments, documentation, meaning mapping, aerial, aerial photo mapping, imagery taken with drones, topo, LIDAR, crack and distress mapping, and layering all this information, including drains, foundation conditions, distress and repairs. All this stuff informs the performance and the resistance and the, the integrity of that spillway structure. We can also do non-destructive um, explorations that would be like geophysical methods and compare them over multiple years to see if there are changes going on in the concrete slabs or in the foundation perform site investigation studies, continued O&M operations, and then implement remedial measures and defensive measures as necessary. So key takeaway points from this presentation, spillway scour and risk characterization is uh, generally can be a complex process and it needs to involve multiple disciplines, not unlike a lot of the failure modes that we discussed in this best practices, but, but we need to bring in people who are knowledgeable and have experience in hydraulics and hydraulic engineering, geology, geotechnical, hydrology, structural engineering, mechanical engineering. Everybody needs to have um, a, a good team effort and communicate well with each other so that we can adequately um, characterize that risk. We have to recognize that there's temporal changes in the risk over time. So the risk can migrate due to um, long-term neglect or, or lack of observations or lack of action on a, on a particular spillway. And those are due to the temporal effects. Case studies illustrate the importance of foundation, geologic, geotechnical conditions and characterization and understanding. Be prepared with this coming into the risk assessment, have information available, have it understood as you head in and have these discussions. Uh, the flow stream power frequency duration are important and extreme floods uh, may actually not control the risk for, for many spillway failure modes. A lot of times it's more of a higher frequency flow that might, um, might cause damage because it's because it's recurrence interval might be so much higher. So the flow hydraulics concentrations due to spatial variation and slope geometry, hydraulics, spillway configuration, Geology must be considered. And modeling and, and numerical analysis significantly informs our risk characterization, and it's a great tool to help us use our experienced and knowledgeable judgment in when we're assessing the relative uh, risk characterization for a spillway failure mode.